inform the present and influence the future of Reston through educational programs like this one. And we are a nonprofit organization and we rely on donations and membership. So if you're not a member and you'd like to be, you can go to the table um, after the presentation and Alex will help you out. Or you can go to our website or Facebook page and get more information. Um, among the trust's goals are to engage the public in an exploration of community history, to collect, preserve, and interpret the artifacts and documents of Reston's history. And this is exactly what our speaker today, Chris Rooney, does um, really in his spare time. I consider him our unofficial Reston ar archivist. And he does this when he's not working as an illustrator and a graphic designer. I became aware of Chris's devotion to Reston history through a Facebook group called Reston Remember When. Is there anybody here that's part of that group? <coughs> exactly. Well, you can attest to the fact of the joy that he's brought to so many of us and the nostalgia that he's invoked by his just treasure trove of artifacts, of um, pictures that we've, most of us have never seen. And so about, I think it was about a year and a half ago, he started putting up pictures of, of uh, marketing materials. And a lot of them were from the 60s, and I don't think any of us had ever seen them. He put up some from the 70s and 80s, too, that I think a lot of us grew up with. And it sparked so much conversation online. There were hundreds of people in the group that were responding to it. And I just thought, well, this could be a really great presentation. I think there's a lot of interest. So on a lark, I had never met Chris, even though we both went to South Lakes, but a few years apart. So on a lark, I just said, hey, would you consider coming to Reston, coming back to Reston, and doing a presentation? And so really appreciate that he did come back from Berkeley. He jumped at the chance to come back to his hometown. <coughs> now, there have been several books photo essays, and even a fantastic documentary about Reston over the years that have looked at this place from many angles and perspectives. But what if Reston were to script its own autobiography? I think that what you're about to see will give you some insight into how Reston portrayed itself since its inception and what it yearned to be during its first few chapters. Tonight, Chris will fill us in on the missing bit of Reston's early history in the form of the initial advertising targeting the Washington, D.C. area. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Chris Rooney. Thanks, Christina. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming this evening. I'm Chris Rooney. Uh, a little bit about myself that uh, Christina did already mention. I'm a native Prestonian who grew up attending Hunter's Woods, Langston Hughes, and South Lakes. Yes, that was, that was me in the beginning. For the last two decades, I've been working in the advertising and design trenches of San Francisco, creating you name it for just about every industry under the sun, from Silicon Valley tech firms and startups, to Napa, Napa Valley wines, to even a fried chicken restaurant in Saudi Arabia. About a year or so ago, in my spare time, I was searching through online archives of the Washington Post and its one-time crosstown rival, the Washington Evening Star, looking for information on my DC ancestors dating back to the early 1800s. In the process, I was also curious to see what I could find there on the early years of Reston. As I began to uncover just not just art of not just art not just articles about Reston, but actual advertisements from the 60s. Many of these ads ran just once in these two newspapers about a half century ago, and probably haven't seen the light of day since. So what you probably already know is that during the years 1965 and 66, Reston was getting a lot of media attention nationally from magazine publications like Life, Newsweek, Ebony and Look magazines as one of the first of potentially many American new towns. But how did Reston present itself locally to draw in potential home buyers, businesses, and those curious to see what a planned community could be? 
Let's take a step back and drive four hours north to New York City, where Reston essentially had its genesis with native New Yorker Robert Simon. But more specifically, let's look at Madison Avenue. The heart of the American advertising industry that many of you may know was the inspiration for the fictional television series, Mad Men. <laughs> Modern advertising truly began in 1949 when admin Bill Burnback started Doyle Dane Burnback, or DDB, a New York agency whose creativity transformed the industry. Prior to DDB, many ad agencies focused on hard sell techniques using repetitive catchphrases, authority figures, diagrams, and reams of information in their ads. The creative revolution, which gathered steam in the 1960s, instead used creativity and humor to generate attention and sales. It took its name from an essay written by Burnback entitled Manifesto for the Creative Revolution, in which he urged that good taste good art, and good writing can be good selling. DDB's ads were simple, honest, and witty, and credited the reader with intelligence. Their uncluttered layouts took influences from the burgeoning field of graphic design, and they employed a tone of voice that could be daringly self-deprecating, such as, Avis is only number two, so we try harder. Or more notably, the iconic Volkswagen campaign that described the Beetle as a lemon. DDB was also the first agency to put art directors and copywriters together to work as a team. Previously, a copywriter would write a headline and send the concept to the art department to be illustrated. Burnback came to believe that an art director and a copywriter working together would produce more powerful advertising, a principle sometimes expressed as one plus one equals three. Two of DDB's best-known campaigns during the 60s were Volkswagen, as I mentioned, and Levy's Jewish Rye Bread. How, yeah, these are great. Uh, <clears throat> burn back, oh, excuse me. So how do you make a German compact car and an ethnic bread interesting to give them a broader appeal with simple, clever, and memorable advertising? So these are two well-known ads, Think Small and Lemon. So as you see here, this is what DDB's ads for Volkswagen typically look like. And when I say simplicity, this tongue-in-cheek analysis that I found takes the iconic Think Small Volkswagen ad and shows you what could be done to it if you employed visual and written hard sell techniques, other ads used at the time. So if you go from left to the bottom one, and then just follow me here. So one, show the product. Bring it closer to the camera. Two, don't use negative headlines. Don't think small. Think big. Whenever possible, use the product name in the headline. Think Volkswagen. Whenever possible, show people enjoying your product. Look at those affluent people and horses around our car. Always feature news in your advertisement. The latest model is the best. Always give prominent display to your product logo. Volkswagen. Avoid all unpleasant connotation about your product. Don't mention that this car originated in Nazi Germany. <laughs> Always tell the reader where he can buy your product. <coughs> Come on in into our showroom. Always localize your ads. Look at all these nearby dealerships. Well, as you can see, by the end, you're left with a very convoluted message that tries to tell everything, yet leaves the reader retaining nothing. This creative notion began to filter quickly through the ad world during the 1960s, as we will later see in the early advertising of Reston. Meanwhile, Robert Simon starts Reston. He brings in architects, planners, engineers, and sculptors to help shape this new town in post Jim Crow, Virginia. Just like underdogs Volkswagen and Levy's, 
competing for attention against the big Ford Motors in Wonder Bread to the world, how did Reston set itself apart with marketing in the beginning? Let's look at the first 10 years of Reston for some context. March of 61, Peladrum Corporation, formed by Simon, purchased the Bowman Track of over 7,000 acres. October of 62, construction begins on Lake Ann in the golf course. May of 63, an information center opens where Crescent Hill Apartments are today. March of 64, the Gulf Oil Corporation loans Simon $15 million. 64, the first townhouse is designed. Summer of 64, the golf course opens. Fall of 64, the first model homes are ready and purchases made. November of 64, Air Survey Corporation, the first industry industrial firm moves into Isaac Newton Square. December of 65, the first residents move into their Waterview Cluster townhome. That same month, Lake Ann officially opens and then Safeway and other village center shops open as well. May of 66, Reston's official dedication. That same month, Golf Course Island, the fifth townhouse cluster opens. By 67, the population's over 1,000. Lake Ann Elementary opens with 3, stu or 300 students. September of 67, Golf Oil decides to take over management of Reston, and then Simon is fired. By 1970, the population is 6,800, exceeds Herndon. And by 71, the first 10,000 residents. 1963. The first newspaper ads for Reston appear in the Washington Post and Washington, or Washington Evening Star in 1963. <coughs> With only a master plan and conceptual drawings to go by, these ads can only preview what's to come. The ads employ a hard sell approach because, frankly, a new town from scratch required such. Reston's situation was different than other real estate advertising because it wasn't just selling a house or a new development or neighborhood. It had to deliver beyond that. The earliest ad that I found dates to 19, uh, September of 63 and looks more like a formal invitation, pleasantly inviting the reader to make a visit. I also want to note at the bottom, you can see the, the publication, the date on it, but I'll, I'll, I'll mention, try and mention that throughout. Uh, weeks later, the first visual Reston ad heralds the completion of Lake Ann, the centerpiece of Reston's first village. The optimistic ad overpromises 1,500 people would be living near the lake within a year. Pretty as a picture. This is the first ad to use photography in such a way that it's, it's the, the feature. We see two filmmakers shooting some horseback riders on a bridal trail. I'd be really curious as to where this was taken and if any of that film footage still exists. The last line says, the fall scenery alone is worth the trip, but you'll also get a chance to see a brand new American city starting to come to life. Uh, you'll notice that the, the very early ads at the bottom say Reston Residential Division. The ads would later be simplified to end with the Reston logo, as you will see, and a streamlined uh, set of directions. This is another similar ad toting the, uh, the golf course. 1964. This 1964 lists a highly ambitious estimated completion dates for residential, recreational, commercial, and industrial construction in the coming year. It's kind of an odd ad in what they're, they're showing here. A number of these de dates definitely fell short, but it all got done. The first true teaser ads follow and begin to show what is physically in store for the first phase of Reston. Concept drawings paint a partial picture of Reston's urbanity in, an urban, in a country setting.
And so as I was uncovering these ads, I began to wonder who created them. The only indication is in the upper right-hand corner in a few of these ads. It's really small, way at the top. And it says, Marvin Gersten Advertising, which was a Washington, D.C.-based agency. Marvin Gerson passed away in 2010, but I recently reached out to his son via email. He told me, and I quote, during the 1960s when I was in elementary school, I remember visiting Reston with my father while I was under construction. I was under the impression that he was the lead advertiser also for Columbia, Maryland, a little later, in Tyson's Corner, and of all things, the Watergate Hotel. His agency was relatively small at the time. I remember a room with several artists and layout people my father and maybe one or two others who would have written copy and interacted with clients. Of course, Marvin had overall control of the ads. He both drew well and wrote copy. I remember, I remember him explaining to me that he was one of the first to market suburban real estate developments with themes, that is, names and design elements intended to evoke an ambiance to make these middle class suburban developments seem more upscale and pastoral than they really were. I suspect he was one of the first advertisers to specialize, and he was certainly in the right place at the right time, suburban development in the 1950s to 1970s. As Lake Ann Village Center and nearby townhouse clusters were taking shape, and the new town finally has its first residence, the ads start to become more interesting and creative starting in late 1965. Prior to that though, which I'll show you those in later 65, prior to that we see a hodgepodge of ads that illustrate Restonians enjoying leisurely activities as if they were at a resort or country club. So as you can see, uh, there's uh, theater and outdoor events and some of the other things that look familiar to you today. The summer of 65 introduces a new campaign using very simple headlines set in the chubby typeface Cooper Black, just like what we saw in the earlier levees rye bread ads. That typeface seemed to be popular at the time as it was used in such places as the Beach Boys' iconic Pet Sounds album cover and many other uh, places in pop culture and publication. various shoe wear or footwear to do different activities, whether getting dressy or ice skating or ballet, uh, tennis shoes, uh, boots for horseback riding, and of course golf shoes. Now, here's where we begin to credit the, the reader's intelligence with the use of quotes from literature, poetry, philosophy, and antiquities from the likes of Robert Frost, Nietzsche, D.H. Lawrence, Emerson, Marcus Aurelius to appeal to those looking to ro relocate to Reston. In this campaign that stretched from September 1965 into the fall of 66, you'll see that the headline pulls a line from a much longer quote below, below it. <coughs> Attributing it to its writer. The copy to the right of it deals specifically on one aspect of Reston revealing these truths. Similar to what we saw with Volkswagen's decade-long ad campaign for the Beetle. Whereas Volkswagen only like talked about one little feature, one little thing that made it quirky or interesting. 
Uh, I'll take you through each of these ads and give you kind of the essence of each ad because there's a lot to read here. So with this one, I can listen to the silence. Uh, they polled people who visit Reston and the thing that, among the things that they liked best was that it was quiet. This next ad, a living, organic, believing community, uh, explains that a town's growth should be organic and not manufactured. Rightly to perceive a thing is to credit it or cr create it. This addresses Reston's alternative to suburban sprawl. Even then, that was you know an issue with very plain, um, mass-produced suburban housing with no essence to it. <laughs> Children have a good many hard times. Here, we're dealing with the interconnecting pathways and sculptures for kids to play on. And it also talks about Fairfax County's reputation for having good schools. Witch burning used to be a virtue. Here we see descriptions of the various choices, uh, activity choices, and the places to go, including the RCC, where we are today. Count the drops that make a lake full. This is all about the tranquility and things you can do around and on the lake. Now mind you, these ads were running like continuously every week during the course of this year. So it was like a new ad each, each week, which you don't really see today. You see the same repetitive ad till it gets in your head, at least as long as the ad buy, which means whoever is wanting to advertise the, 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 the budget that, that they have to put in a publication. Women, music, poetry, art, and science. It's taken from Carl Sandburg. And deciphering this, it, it's basically speaking to the educated working man and how working closer to rest and would make his life that much better. A clue to lead one kingly truth from Emerson. This only talks about the Outlook Tower outside here in the Sunboat Sculpture. And it reads, you can take a friend with you if you like. There is room for two at the top. Some of our people want to call it Lover's Outlook, but we like the simpler name that embraces families and all kinds of people. All kinds of people like it. Nothing to breathe but air. This explains the lake chilled air conditioning system that was uh, originally designed. If you're not familiar with that, it's a whole system over near the, the tennis courts where water would come in to the lake and it would be chilled and it would filter through all the buildings around here. That's a whole other talk. <laughs> uh, yeah. Man can live without cooks. And this highlights the shop features around the plaza now that uh, retail was uh, about to start. And uh, said, it says, some people say the shop fronts remind them of medieval guild insignia designed to human scale but ancient in feeling. Produced according to its nature, and this is all about letting nature dictate how residents developed, and that's a big part of the, the master plan of, of the town. The power to decide. Tries to clear up the misconception of what is a planned community, as Reston is not planning people's lives, only planning that goes into making a community. As close as he wanted to come from Robert Frost, this is the first of three ads on sculptor Gonzalo Fonseca. Three ads, just talking about the sculptor who you know, created the, the sunboat sculpture and the wooden sculptures that uh, used to be here 
and the concrete forms around the North Shore pedestrian tunnel. Three ads about this one guy. To the sound of bells. This uh, corresponds to the, the pageantry of the dedication of the plaza that December of 65. Remain seated as little as possible from Nietzsche. This is the second ad on sculptor uh, Gonzalo Fonseca. And you can see this was the uh, wooden sculpture that used to uh, be out in the plaza. It's no longer there, unfortunately. In the last of the three ads on him, uh, the days that make us happy. All this description about him and what he was doing and what it brings to rest and made it unique. Do not free a camel. It's just, it's just uh, talking about activities improve the quality of life. <coughs> the art of drawing conclusions. Uh, you'll see this used to be the uh, horse stable on uh, Reston Parkway. And it was built on top of the pipeline that <clears throat> basically cuts a, uh, a scar right through Reston. And, trying to figure out what they would do, make use of that space. And here it says, <clears throat> we could hardly wish this imperfection away. Negotiations with the pipeline company taught us that if we could build those structures on the earth that covered the pipe. So we had to find ways of making it either useful or beautiful, preferably both. And the planners of Reston did. And within the copy, this is also the first time that the future Hunters Woods Village Center is mentioned, 1966. So that was already, you know, in the works, or that was the next thing that uh, Bob was hoping to get to. Only the hours are serene. And again, this is highlighting the horse stables built over the pipeline. And also mentioned some other activities, like uh, ice skiing that you see on, on the lake. By the end of 66, the campaign uh, transforms into quotes from the first inhabitants of Reston and is no longer these quotes from literature and other places. And so it becomes more focused on the people that now live in Reston. <clears throat> We're entirely happy here. And I, I won't go into everything that's said here, and it's just more about the headlines and what they uh, took from the people that lived there and, and uh, made into an ad. Again, this is about the, the official dedication of Reston that happened in uh, May of 66. No chauffeur's cap for mother, and talked about, uh, you know, allowing children to, to be kids and, and uh, just go outside and do their thing. And, uh, also, it made it easier with the, the uh, interconnecting pathways to get to places, to activities, rather than you know, getting your car, driving in the suburbs to some other place. It, it's all right there. Privacy without being isolated. And I'm assuming this ad of, of uh, girls taking ballet class happened right over there in that space. Yes, there was boys. Same <laughs> ballet. Uh, the isn't there? From my understanding, there's a a, a little performance or, or uh, activity space oh, over here. You see it or one? Okay, okay. My children have everything available. So once again, it's talking about family and children. What a great place resting can be. End of 66, the, the campaign runs its course. 1967 rolls around, and I believe financial issues most likely put advertising on the back burners. 
Uh, Bob is forced out in October, but Reston continues to grow. Uh, I did come across smaller ads that were more hard sell promoting home lots and subdivisions, such as this one, where actual helicopter tours of Reston were being offered, so you could take a look at the, the wooded lots that were available if you were looking to buy. Sixty-eight and sixty-nine, advertising drops off to a mere trickle. Uh, hard sell techniques come back in the form of this ad to preview new homes like a Hollywood star map. So, uh, the map is a little bit inaccurate as it shows the extension of North Shore Drive as Forest Edge Drive. There is no Forest Edge Drive. I don't know if that was in the works or it was just a mistake that was made, but. This ad towing Reston's unique commuter bus service for professionals going to DC and back actually ran the day that my parents got married in April of 1969. They're right here, actually. Yes. They were living in Falls Church at the time, but would soon start house hunting in the area with hopes to begin a family. So 1970. Can anyone tell me what happened for the first time in April of 1970, besides my parents' first anniversary? <laughs> Does anybody old enough remember? No? April of, let's say April 22nd, 1970. Yes. The first Earth Day. And, uh, and Reston was there for it with an ad featuring Vern Walker, Reston's Nature Center director, an ecology pipe piper, judging by this ad, leading children through a field. Reston was concerned with the environment before the environment became a concern. Yeah. Under Gulf Reston's management, Reston is expanding further into Hunter's Woods area of town, promoting, prompting new advertising. I'm not sure who was creating ads at this time, but there's still the use of wit and intelligence in these next headlines to set Reston apart. Reston is a supermarket. The selection of homes varied as more traditional single-family homes were being built under Gulf's helm, especially in the Hunters Woods area. Reston's bridal registry. Yes, a play on words. And it, and it says, if your hobby is horses, wrong, yes. Reston is the place. At this time, they were still having steeplechase races and polo matches in, in the fields and places around Reston. Yeah. That's how undeveloped it was at the time, 1970. But, you know, we, with Hunter's Woods area, with the stables and the trails and everything like that, it was designed to uh, get people's interest who are horse enthusiasts to move to Reston. Reston has found the missing link. Once again, an ad that preaches the virtues of Reston's connected pathways and tunnels. Reston's after dinner set. And here it says, uh, by this time, over 14 tennis courts and promises there will soon be 18. The Reston chauffeur. Chauffeur, like the year before, another ad talking about the, the commuter bus service. Golf in Reston is twice as good, and uh, this is course promoting the opening of Reston, so uh, a second golf course. Mm -hmm. So we get to 1971. It's now 10 years after Reston's inception. 
This ad is my favorite and most telling of Reston as I used it to help promote this event today. It was a full page ad that ran on February 27th. It shows an established community, both in place and people, with residents, businessmen and women, activists, teachers, leaders all brought together. Their collective voices are what made Reston come to life. My parents, who I mentioned earlier, getting married in 1969, moved into their new Reston home the month before this ad ran while expecting their first child. Exactly two months to the day after this ad appeared, Reston heard a new voice, a crying one at that, mind you, in the form of me. So I, I want to conclude with two last ads from 1971 and 73 that follow in the same vein as this one and also photographed right outside these doors. This ad's headline is pregnant, and it shows a couple walking over the Van Gogh Bridge. This was the only ad that directly targeted baby boomers and addressed the generation gap. And it says within it, young people are pregnant, pregnant with energy, drive, and the courage to challenge what is done yesterday as not necessarily being the solution for what is needed today. That is why so many young people are moving to Reston. And then lastly this, because there are more of you. Within it says people, as individual as you are, families with as many unique desires as your family living in Reston. And this is a, really a testament to Reston's success. Thank you. And lastly, I also want to thank all those who invited me to speak here today. And if you'd like to look closer at any of the ads, I'm more than happy to go back. But I also self-published a book containing all of them as a gift to the Rescue Museum that I hope fits, nice, fits in nicely with their collections and other artifacts. Thanks. Thank you.